Babel. Uh, so, we are uh, continuing with a lecture that we gave 15 days ago, the second part, about the Tower of Babel, which is a very interesting uh, topic, especially in this day and age. Remember that, uh, <coughs> as we explained in other lectures, this uh, story about the Tower of Babel is written in the chapter 11 of the book of Genesis in the Bible. And the builder of this tower is mentioned in the chapter number 10 of the same book of Genesis. And uh, again, we remind you that the whole book, the Bible, is written based on the Kabbalah, which is synthesized in the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life, as you see, as we mentioned in many lectures, is a symbol in which we find ten spheres called Sephiroth. So everything that is written in the Bible refers or goes to the tree of life, the ten Sephiroth. That's why we mention it many times. So we always state that anybody that wants to know the hidden wisdom within the scriptures, uh, the Bible, this person has to study the tree of life. Because otherwise, we start building a Babel, a tower of Babel, a t a t a confusion. And we do not understand what is written in, uh, in the Bible. The Tower of Babel is uh, famous. Everybody mentioned it. Because uh, in that tower, according to the book of Genesis, is where started the many languages that we speak in the world. Of course, every symbol, every story written in any book, whether it is the Bible, whether it are the scriptures of Buddha, or the scriptures of uh, the Hindus, the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, or any other sacred book of other religion, all of them are written in symbol, the Quran. And in order to understand, we have to understand that each symbol uh, is interpreted in seven ways, seven manners. And uh, the science of the Bible, which is the science of Kabbalah, is that science given to the Western world in order to understand the wisdom. Remember that uh, the Bible is, uh, we will say, the sacred book given to the Westerns in order for them to understand how the path of the civilization has, is. And uh, when the Bible mentions a tower, we always uh, refer, Gnostics, we always refer that everything written in the Bible or any book is always related to the human being. Because the goal of life is to create the human being into the image of God. But under this process that... Uh, we call it the self-realization of the being. 
the awakening, the illumination, the enlightenment of each one of us, there is always uh, obstacles. There is always rules that we have to follow. And the whole thing is really related with that axiom written in the threshold of the temple of Delphi in Greece that says in Latin, Nocete ipsum, which translated into English means know thyself. So the action continues stating, know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. So if you, will, if you want to know the mysteries of any religion, you have to study yourself. Because if you want to study uh, or to inquire about the mysteries of the Bible or of or the scriptures of Buddha, of Krishna, uh, only outside, without uh, gain, going into your psyche within yourself, then of course you don't discover anything. Because uh, remember that uh, the human being is called the microcosmo of the macrocosmo. So everything has to be reflected in ourselves. And it is. But we have to develop that in order to comprehend. So the Tower of Babel, or the story of Noah and the Ark, is something written in order for us to comprehend the way in which we had to do the work. And of course, I repeat, it is indispensable, mandatory, for anyone that wants to walk on the path of the civilization to study this tree of life, the ten sephirot. And it's a study that endures the whole life in order to comprehend every single story, every single uh, mystery in the book uh, or the Bible, especially, especially Genesis. So, <coughs> in the previous lecture, we stated that we came down from the Milky Way, from the stars, as consciousness, as souls, we are connected to the spirit. And we said that that spirit dwells in the stars. But we stated that it's not physically. When we mention the stars, we are mentioning the superior dimensions of nature. Because we are in this physical three-dimensional world. But above this third dimension, we find the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. Which, is, uh, uh, which are uh, described in the Tree of Life that many of you might have it already. And if you don't have it, we can give it to you and you study the different dimensions in relation with this Tree of Life or Ten Sephiroth, which are the description of the universe in relation with a human being. So, the spirit, of course, is related with the sixth dimension. In previous lectures, we stated that the spirit is energy, it has no form, but she's, each one of us has its own inner spirit, or neuma, as called in Greek. And we stated that within each one of our own particular spirit, there is always three atoms. And those three atoms are always related to the first triangle that we find in the tree of life. Where we find the three first spheres 
which are named Keter, Chokmah, Bina, which in Christianity are called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which in Hinduism are called Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. In other words, if you study every single religion, you will find these three principles named according to their language, according to their culture. These are three principles. We will say forces that uh, could become gods. When we said gods, we are related with that, what we call a, a, creation, a creator. Because these three primary forces, positive, negative, neutral, which are also called holy affirmation, holy denying, and holy conciliation. These three forces are the forces that we call the ray of creation. So, in order for any creation to happen, needs to, these three forces to be united. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Keter, Chokmah, Binah. And they must dwell in different levels within each unit that is created. And that's precisely the beauty of all of this, because if you want to inquire, where are those three principles called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, you find them everywhere in every single atom of the universe. So the goal of, uh, of the universe is to create more complicated organisms in order for those three forces to manifest and to express their beauty or, or their power of creation, which in the final synthesis is a human being, is what they want to create into, into their own image. When we said image, we, we, we refer to the power of creation. And that's why we stated that these three particles are within every single spirit. If you concentrate in your own spirit, your own neuma, or your own Buddha, you discover that within him, there are these three primary forces give the power of creation in different levels. Now, not all of those spirits have the power of a God. It means to create with wisdom. So therefore, each one of our spirits is connected to those great beings that we call cosmocreators, that we call gods, divas, angels, divine beings that dwell in the higher dimensions, and that they already know how to do divine creations. But we do not know. That's why we are connected to those beings through these three primary forces that we have in our spirit. Imagine these three primary forces as the, how you call the plug that you take in order to connect to the electricity. You always find three elements there. You want electricity, then you plug the wire into the connection. It is a triangle. And from there you receive the electricity. So in the same way, our own energy, which is our own spirit, has these three primary forces that should and must be connected to any of the seven main forces that are there in the sixth dimension. And uh, that the Bible calls Elohim, which means gods and goddesses. We call them cosmocreators. In different religions, you find different names for these beings that have already the wisdom, the light. And we need that light. 
And that's why we receive that light through these three primary forces in our spirit from the sixth dimension into our physical body. And this is precisely how we have to understand. Because the physical body, as we explained in the last lecture, or the speaker was explaining, is a marvelous instrument, a machine created by divine forces. And that is given unto us as a gift for us to do what we have to do. And this is precisely the topic of this lecture. We have three particles that we can call it also atoms of these three primary forces of our spirit in our physical body. Between the eyebrows in the very root of the nose we have the atom of the father which is called Keter, the crown, here, Brahma, is a magnetic point between the eyebrows. And uh, that force has its kingdom in heaven. As, you, as we already mentioned, it's from the sixth dimension, that is heaven superior dimension. But in the physical body, heaven is the head. You see? That's why in this graphic that we are seeing here, we see that these three primary forces are related with the head of the picture that we see. Exactly. And when you see the, the, the image of Shiva, you always find three lines in his forehead. Because these three lines, of course, symbolize the three primary forces related with heaven. So when you read the Bible or any sacred book and you read about heaven, then you have to understand that that heaven is superior dimensions, but it's also your head. That's the heaven of your body. So in this head is where you have the three primary forces. You have another atom which is the called the atom of the Holy Spirit, or the atom of Shiva, which is in the pineal gland. The pineal gland is in the very center of the brain. And a little bit ahead of the pineal gland, you have the pituitary gland. <coughs> and then you have the, the atom of the sun. So we have these three particles of this holy trinity, or tree unity, that is an every single unit in the universe in our head. So when you said Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in, in relation with uh, primary forces, principles, they are in your head. Father in the root of your nose, the Son in the pituitary gland, and the Holy Spirit in the pineal gland. So this is how when you deny the Trinity, or when you deny God, you are denying those principles that you have in your head. Of course, you can see them and you be in contact with them when you awake senses capable of seeing them. Because the physical senses only put you in contact with the exterior world. But with the physical senses you cannot see what you have inside your body. Unless you go to a laboratory and have x-rays. And then you can see what you have within your physical body. But there is another sense which is called clairvoyance. That if you awake it, then you can see inside of you. But you need to awake it. It's another sense called the sixth sense. And of course, even if you go to a laboratory and want to have x-ray, you wouldn't find the three atoms because there's atoms. Atom means small, very small infinitesimal particles of that. This is how we are connected to our spirit and how, and how that the spirit performs according to the superior laws 
in the physical plane, the physical body, what we had to perform. For instance, uh, the kingdom of the father is the brain. So in the brain, of course, you have that power of the first principle called Keter, Brahma, the father. And in the brain, of course, he has his kingdom, but uh, is not fully developed. Because you know very well that scarcely we use a 3% or maybe more of, of the brain. Our duty is precisely to develop the whole heaven or the whole brain. This is a process. The power or the kingdom of God, the Father, is reflected in the liver. The liver, which is that gigantic or huge gland that we have in the, le in the right side of the body. Through that, of course, is how the Father reflects his law. The law that we call of the Glorian is performed to the liver. That's why we state if a person has a good liver, has a good blood, and as a consequence, the rest of the organism works very well. But if you destroy your liver, you destroy your whole life. So this is how the law, which sometimes we call the law of karma, cause and effect, works to the body. Of course, it works to other organs, but mainly to the liver. This is how we said that gebura, the law, works to the liver. Because this is how the father, the monad, works in us through the three primary forces. In other words, our own spirit always obey the three primary forces that we are talking here. How do we, another name that we call for these three primary forces together? We call it Glorian. That's the name for all of it. Glorian. Hmm. In Buddhism, we will say, it is the Buddha of the Buddha. But our own particular spirit is what in Buddhism is called our own Buddha. And he is always connected to these three primary forces. And in order to perform the self-realization of the being, we have to obey the Glorian. The monad, our own particular monad or spirit, has to obey the Glorian. If our monad is obeying the Glorian, we here in the physical plane have to obey the Glorian as well. In order to self-realize ourselves. But of course, that's why we said that we have to follow the forces of the superior worlds. Is what Jesus of Nazareth says in the Bible. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's, it's a prayer in order to call those forces and to perform the self realization. It's not a prayer to do it mechanically. Something that we have to perform inside of us. See, for instance, the Holy Spirit, which is Bina, Shiva, has his dominion in the pineal land. And he controls the whole central nervous system. The cerebrum and spinal nervous system. Of course, the trident is the symbol of this. Uh, the reflection of that power of the pineal gland or the power of, of Shiva is shown in the physical plane through the sexual organs. That's why we say always, when we talk about the Holy Spirit in heaven, it's a pineal gland. But in the physical plane, it was to the sexual organs. That's why in Hinduism they say that Shiva is the creator. Because he is indeed the, the one that is in charge of everything that we do here 
related with creation is Shiva, is the Holy Spirit, Bina, here, in the pineal gland. When you study endocrinology, you know very well the inner relationship between the pineal gland and the sexual glands. The hormones of the pineal gland contribute with the development of uh, the sexual organs, sexual glands. And the hormones of the sexual gland, sexual glands contribute with the development of the pineal gland. So this is a uh, axis that we study here in Gnostic endocrinology. And that uh, uh, precisely is the base for the contraceptives that women take in order to put in your system elements that the pineal gland with the hormones command the body to build in order for the woman to release one of them every month. But when the woman takes contraceptives, the pineal gland doesn't command the glands to release the ovum because the pineal gland senses that the elements are already there because the woman takes it through her mouth. So therefore that is an obstruction that the women do in their system for the Holy Spirit or Bina or Shiva don't, don't to do the work in the sexual glands. But of course, it, it damages the sexual organs <coughs> in the pineal gland. That's why uh, it is stated that uh, the mind, as you know, works through the brain. Because we think, and we know very well that when you have thoughts, it's here where we feel the thoughts in our head, in heaven. Hmm? So that's precisely the problem, as you see. The Bible called the mind Satan, or Lucifer, which is always making troubles to God. People think, oh yeah, it's somebody outside of you. No, it's inside of you. It's your own mind. That is making trouble in the, in, the, in the work of the Glorian, which is working in every single organism. So that's precisely, you see, the, the reflection of the kingdom of the Father is in the liver. The reflection of the kingdom of the Holy Spirit is in the sexual organs. Unfortunately, in the sexual organs is how we degenerate and how in this day and age people really abuse of the sexual organs. And, and, and this is a, a mess that we made in the, uh, of our bodies, of our persons. And that's why uh, the reflection of the forces which are in heaven, in the lower abdomen, which is the liver and sex, are creating in us a lot of problems, sicknesses, etc. Well, behold now, the Son of God, which is called Chokhmah, wisdom, which is in the pituitary gland, which is precisely a little bit ahead in the brain of the pineal gland. The reflection of that atom of the pituitary gland is in the heart. As the Father reflects his power in the liver and the Holy Spirit reflects his power in the sex, the pituitary gland, which is the sun, reflects its power in the heart. And in the heart, we have that atom that we call the atom nous. That atom nous means the intuitive force, the abstract mind that only obeys the glory end. Mm -hmm. You see here, that's why we state, in order to enter into the initiation, our own spirit, our own monad, always does it through the heart. Our own spirit tries, of course, to self-realize his creature in the physical body through the brain. But the brain has a contra uh, the, against it the liver, where we have the impurities. Is where we find the voluntary movements of the body, the voluntary movements of the body. And then the, our own spirit, when it wants to self-realize 
the creature, his own soul, realizes that he, if he does it through the brain in relation with the liver, he cannot do it because he has a, a, a lot of enemies, sicknesses. It's called the secret enemy uh, relationship with karma. And if he does it through the pineal gland, he does it to the pineal gland, he wants to do it through the pineal gland, then he finds that the opposite of that force is in the sex. And of course, in that way it's impossible. Because the pituitary gland is controlling all the involuntary movements of the body related with digestion, the circulatory system, all the instinctual movements that we have that uh, we don't have control over them. The one that, that intelligence that controls all the functions of the physical organism the, it's called the involuntary movements because we don't uh, have will on them. Use the Holy Spirit. And of course, the involuntary movements of the sexual organ are the worst because people are, of course, dried by the sexual degeneration, sexual impulses. They don't control the sexual force. So therefore, the monad cannot self-realize through that system as well. The only system that obey the Glorian without problems is the heart. Because in the heart we have the atom nous that obeys completely the commands of the three primary forces. And the heart is precisely that organ that has the two options, voluntary and involuntary movements of the physical body. That's why when we enter into the initiation, we have to place our mind in the heart and to follow the heart because that's the way in order to purify the rest of ourselves and to know ourselves. Because that atom that we have in the left ventricle of the heart, which is called nous, is the only part in our body that obeys the Glorian, that obeys God. And I repeat, that atom is called in the Bible, Noah. And you hear, of course, in, in, in this uh, lecture, that uh, when God, when the forces, the superior forces, want to, to see what's going on with humanity, people think, that that God is an old man with a long beard, long hair, gray hair, seated there in the clouds or somehow in the universe. Without comprehending, without understanding, that is a force that is everywhere in the superior world. And when that force descends to see what is going on with humanity, it goes as an energy in each one of us. It's an energy. It's not a person. He wants to know, if God wants to know, the, the cosmo creator, the Elohim above, wants to know what's going on with you. This is entering your heaven of your head. And through that enters into all the organism and see all your actions, all your deeds. So nobody can escape from that. And this is how God knows, as according to the Bible says, that when he descended into the earth, that earth is a symbol of the planet earth, and it's also the symbol of the physical body, of each one of us. And then he sees that all the earth is polluted, degenerated. Because he's law, and the only good thing that he finds in this all pollution is Noah, the heart, the atom. Noose in the heart. It's the only good thing. Because when he, when the monarch enters and investigates the brain in relation with the liver, he finds a lot of impurities, sicknesses, karma. And when he finds through the pineal gland, it goes directly into the reflection, which is the sexual organs. He just can believe it. And then the only thing pure is the atom nous. So therefore, comes the atom news, he says that Noah walked with God 
To walk with God means to enter into the self-realization of the being. That's what it means. Now, this Noah, atom news in the heart, has to follow the rules of the three primary forces. What are those rules? That these three primary forces need vehicles in order to make of us his own image. A human being. You remember that the Bible says that a human being is made into the image of God. But that is not physical. If you think that God is physical, and many people think, of course, you think, oh, the image of God is my physical body. So God is a, a, an old man down there that has eyes like me, nose like me, etc., and I am his reflection, his image. No. That means that you have to reflect all that which is God above in yourself. You have to reflect the universe in you. And your physical body is the instrument that has all those principles in order to develop that within you. But in order to do that, you, have, you need to create vehicles for each one of those three primary forces in order for them to act consciously with wisdom, with will, within you. And that's why it is written there that Noah created or engendered three sons. Why three? Because you know, we're talking about the three primary forces here. He didn't engender four or five or six, only three. And their name were Shem, Ham, and Yafet. These three primary bodies, or sons of Noah, as a symbol. Or those three bodies that we have to create within. We have to engender that. But we have to know the mystery of Noah. Because only Noah can do it. So for that, of course, <coughs> we gave the other lectures before, which are already there in the website, in relation with the measurements of the ark that you had to follow and all the mystery of the creation of these three children, which are three bodies. Remember that when we talk about Gnosticism, we refer to the knowledge, to, to Gnosis, or to the doctrine, to the Bible, to you, not to outside. We can talk about that too, but now we are related with our own selves, because this is what is important, to discover that. So you have your own particular Noah in your left ventricle of your heart. Thank you. And this Noah has to create three sons. The first one, Shem, is a vehicle for the sun. Shem in Hebrew means name. When you said Baruch Hashem, holy be the name. And when you want to name the name of God, you said Shem Ham Amafresh, the holy name, which is not name or not, or not pronounced. But that's some, some symbol that that is hidden for those people that are looking for the knowledge. So when you discover the meaning of that, then you discover the reality why the book of Genesis was written in that way. Because the book of Genesis was written by Moses. And Moses was a Gnostic. At that time, when he was alive, of course, Gnosis was named in another way. Because Gnosis means knowledge, which in Hebrew is Da'at. And the whole Genesis in relation with that, with knowledge, hidden, mysteries, that you have to inquire. So we say that this Shem, Shem, the first son of Noah, is the astral body. That vehicle, that channel, the forces of the sun. And then we have the second son of Noah, which is Ham. 
This uh, name in Hebrew means hot. And ham, of course, is the symbol of the mental soul body, the mind, human mind. And the third is yafet, which is related with the causal body. That's why when you study Kabbalah, the Kabbalah says that Shem is in relation with the right column of the tree of life. You see, the right is there, Hod. And the left is Ham. Literally with the left, which is Netzah. And Yafet, which is purple, they say, is the one that conciliates the two. And is Tifereth, which is the causal body. Of course, purple is a color that unites red and Blue. If you are a painter, you know that, right? So, of course, these three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, had to be created inside of us. And this is how we enter into the Ark, or the Arcanum, the mystery of building these three bodies is between Shem and Ham. And what is between Shem and Ham is Yesod, which is the symbol of the sexual organs. That's why in Hebrew there is hidden the, the, way, the way of saying it says Shem, Ham, and Mafresh. You see, Shem, Ham, Hemaphoresh. This word, Hemaphoresh, means in between or in the middle. So, of course, the stone of Shemaphoresh is what you, uh, they say, Shem Hamaphoresh. Shem Hamaphoresh. You see the, the word name shame and ham are hidden there because it's in between them, which is Yesod. And from there is precisely where come all the willpower that will go re- strictly to Tifereth, which is Yafet, the will. The will. So when you read the Bible, you understand then that the extension of the name the extension of the name comes from Yesod to Tifereth. The extension of because Yafet means he who extends. He, he, he who elongates. That means Yafet. That elongation or extension comes from Yesod to Tifereth through all the bodies. Because first you go here to, to Hod, Netzah, and Tifereth. And Yafet comes after Shem and Ham. This is the extension. The willpower. Our motto is Telema. You need willpower. And only to do what we are stating here. But for you to exercise that willpower, you have to follow your heart. Because it's the, the will of God that we have to do. Which are the, to direct ourselves, to guide ourselves with the three primary forces. And that's why in Gnosticism we say that we have to work with three factors. Which are to die in our psychological weaknesses. To be born, which means to create these three bodies. And to sacrifice for humanity. Only always three, because are the three parts of the Glorian that we have to exercise in order to become a self-realized being. And it's not that something that you have to memorize, that you have to know or to read. No, it's something that you have to perform. But of course, we give lectures, we re- uh, books are written, because you need to know how to do it. But it's not by knowing by memory. 
I know this, but if I don't do it, it doesn't matter if I know it. But if I perform what I am preaching, of course, then it will be the right thing to do. That's why uh, I repeat, this is not in order to believe. Because there are many people think that you believe in this, then you, you, you have that now. The Bible is not written in order to believe in it. The Bible is written in order to study it. You can believe in it, but you have to exercise what is written, what you believe in it. But you have to comprehend that all the myths, because the Bible is written, uh, is a myth. What is a myth? A myth is something that hides a truth or truths. So in order to discover that truth hidden within the myth, you have to comprehend the myth. If you do not comprehend the myth, you cannot uncover the truth within it. And the whole book of Genesis is not only one myth, many myths. And related with the same topic. To teach you what to do in order to be free of the great flood. Because right now, psychologically speaking, we are in a flood of degeneration, pollution, even physical. We want to, free, want to be free of this, of this great flood that little by little is increasing and increasing and killing everybody. What to do? Follow Noah. He knows how to do the ark inside of you. It's not something outside. You follow the rules, you could be saved. By yourself, by your own deeds. Because the Savior is within you too. It's not outside. If you wait, you are waiting for somebody that will come from outside, you are wrong. The Savior, all the things that you need are inside, come from within. So do you realize that? It's what we explained. But when you don't understand this, you enter into confusion. And this is precisely the beauty of the Bible and of the scriptures. When you know this, you know how to read and you know how to follow. Because these uh, scriptures are written for those that are on the path. Symbols like chemistry symbols. That if you don't know what it's H2O, you can repeat H2O. In H2O is a way in order not to be, not to die of thirst. Right? Just take two H2O. But the people in the future will not know what is H2O. And only those that study chemistry will say, oh yeah, they are telling me here that in order to, to calm my thirst, I have to drink water. Simple. So that's precisely the Bible. Symbols. In which they are telling you, do this, do that. But symbols that you have to discover. So then you see that the same story of Noah and the ark is the same story of Jonah. Do you hear that story in the Bible also? That Jonah was swallowed by a big well and that was vomited in the shores of Nineveh. And he was preaching 40 days in Nineveh. In 40 days, the city will be destroyed. But all the, cities of, of the citizens of Nineveh repent. And they follow the, the doctrine of, no, uh, of uh, Jonah. Which really, at the end of Jonah, is the same. Yonah, Noah. The same word. So, in the story of Noah, which if you read the Bible, is just two pages. It's, it's, it's a very short book. It stayed there, that when Noah is vomited by the whale, when he comes out of the whale, <coughs> he goes and, and lies down to rest in a vineyard is growing over his head. This vineyard is, of course, a gourd, a vine. Oh yeah, vineyard is uh, for, for the grapes. But the same, is a vine. Because the vineyard uh, is for the grapes, and the vine of the gourd is our uh, plants related with the element air. 
Because I have symbols there. Everything that we see a vine is air, the symbol. And air is a symbol of the mind. Because the air is in heaven. So when you read air or any vine uh, in the Bible or any book, it's in relation with the mind. So Jonah is having there a gourd over his head in order to cover his head from the rays of the sun. And you can uh, read the story there. But that gourd in synthesis is a symbol of the head. You see how now, in the next month, which is Halloween, they celebrate that with a pumpkin. And they make of each pumpkin a head. Because really, that's a symbol of that uh, fruit, the head, your mind. And that's why at that time in Halloween, all the creatures that exist in the mind of humanity go out. Because Dracula came from humanity. Frankenstein came from humanity. And all those hideous and horrible creatures that you see in Halloween are coming from inside of any human. And of course, you have light in your pumpkin, in your head, those will be scared away. If you have light. But most of the people don't have light in their pumpkins. When Noah comes out of the ark, is the same symbol as Jonah com coming out of the whale. And Noah, after coming out of the ark, he plant a vineyard. And of course, he collect grapes. You see? Same symbol, but in different ways. And he drinks the juice or the wine of course, of the grape, and he become drunk. Now, when you read that literally, we say, what is that? Literally, of course, you think that uh, he becomes a farmer or a husband man, as it says in the Bible, and he plants a, a danger and make uh, grapes and make a ju uh, wine and he drinks and get drunk. Literally. But when you study that, alchemy, you know that a husband man, a farm is somebody that works with the soil which is a physical body and when you said that Noah, after coming out of the ark, became a husband man, a farm means that he had sexual intercourse in relation with Tantra because Tantra is the symbol of sexual transmutation. Chastity, in other words, between men and women. That's why the miracle of the transubstantiation, which is celebrated in, the, in different religions, especially the Catholic Church, when they transform uh, uh, the wine into the substance, the blood of Christ. That's a symbol. When you practice Tantra, you are transforming your own sexual energy into wine of the spirit. And that's the mystery of Noah. Coming out of the ark, meaning he's performing again the sexual act, but according to the law of God. Or as is written in the book of Jonah. That Jonah, after he comes out of the well... That pumping is have, uh, being a shade in his head, but then dries, and the sun is hitting his head with strength. That sun, of course, is the forces of the divine, the Glorian. Like saying, your head is, of course, having, uh, is, uh, has wisdom, but not enough in order to comprehend the light that I'm sending you here. And that's why it says that when, when Jonah sees the light of the sun hitting his head, he becomes enraged or disappointed because he, does, he still does, do not understand. He still do not understand that type of wisdom. Only in a certain level. 
And this is precisely what we have to understand. When you enter into this path, you develop certain levels of knowledge, wisdom. But to go very deep into the knowledge of what God is, it's not easy. God is very profound. And even coming out and self-realize yourself, you discover that even with being you the image of God in a certain level, still God is beyond you, beyond your comprehension. And this is precisely what happened to, to Noah. He starts, of course, as being purified human being, practicing the alchemy, the transmutation, and he drinks the wine, meaning he enters into rapture, into meditation, and discover through the wine of transmutation the grandiosity of that which is the divinity. And that he understands a little bit, but not too much. And that's why he is dizzy. You see, as you right now might be dizzy with this lecture, you said, what is this? You know what I mean? The Ishet also, when he's self-realizing, he's coming enlightened in the meditation and has all those visions, he becomes drowsy, drunk with wisdom. And he wants to understand and comprehend your, his own monad, his, his own Glorian, and he realizes that God is really all knowable. Even though he knows him a little bit, something is beyond that cannot grasp. And that is precisely the drowsiness of Noah, realizing that, you know. And that's why it's written that when he does that, he's naked in his tent. He's completely naked. That reminds me the beginning of Genesis. That it says that when Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit, they realized that they were naked. Same meaning. But in different level. The nakedness of Adam and Eve nakedness, right? Of Adam and Eve is uh, the realization that they do not understand who they are and who God is. They're naked. They have no knowledge. So in this case of Noah, he's also naked. But in a certain level, he realizes that he acquires certain knowledge, but still there's something there that is hidden for him. And who realizes that? If you analyze that, who is the one that realizes that? That God is beyond your comprehension. Who is the one? Your mind. Because your mind is the one that talks a lot of this. My mind now is talking about this knowledge. But I cannot explain the grandiosity of God. God is unknowable. It's far away. And even if you self-realize yourself, God will be always above you. That's why it is written that the one that noticed that, that Noah is naked is Ham, his second son. And Ham is related with the mind. You see? The mind. That mind is solar. It's a human mind. But he realizes the neckness, the neckness of, of his father. And goes and tells to his brothers. But of course, the other bodies, which are within, related with the other centers or nervous systems of the physical body, are not charlatans. They don't talk about. The only one that talk about things and to express to others is the mind. Why? Because the mind which is hum, unfortunately, we will say, or, or for any fortune, is connected to the exterior world. You see, when you close your eyes, when you close your senses, 
And then you allow your mind to be connected only to your spirit. You meditate. You close your eyes and then you receive information, enlightenment. But when your senses are open, and then they give you information to your mind of the exterior world. And that is called Canaan. Canaan means, of course, trader. Trader. Or merchant. What is a trader or merchant? Somebody that trades this for that. I give you this, give me that. That's the mind. And that is precisely it says that the son of Ham is Canaan. Related, of course, with the land of Canaan, which are the senses of the physical body, especially the sexual organs. And that's why Canaan start to talk about the mysteries of his own father. In other words, the mind talks the charlatan. And many in, in, individuals that talk too much about their being and they develop pride. Because I repeat, Ham, the mind, is charlatan. So when the initiate comes out of the rapture and suddenly realizes his mistake, that he was, of course, being drunk and expressing things that he shouldn't. And then he says, damned be Cana Canaan. Right? Not Ham, not the solar mind, but Canaan. Why? Because to the senses is how you communicate and you receive information from the physical world. This is how the mind nurtures itself. And unfortunately, this is how you developed a double psychology. So the problem always in any path is the mind. It's hum. In another symbol of the Bible, you find that the symbol of uh, the mind is Isau. Jacob and Isau, another symbol of the mind, is, is Isau. Cain and Abel. Cain, the symbol of the mind as well. The serpent, the tempting serpent of Eden, is the mind, in other words. The nurses tempt you, always. That Satan that is tempting you, or that tempts Christ in the wilderness three times, is your mind, tempting you in your path. Nobody is going to come outside and tempting you. When you start doing this work, knowing yourself, there will be always Satan within, within you trying to stop you doing it. And that is your mind. Some people enter into meditation, try to meditate, and say, oh no, I cannot do this. This is so, so boring. I don't understand. My mind is always bothering me. And they abandon meditation. In other words, they are conquered by Satan, their own mind. But few are the ones the Jesus Christs, the Buddhas, that conquer Mara and the three daughters of Mara and to conquer the mind. The three daughters are the three nervous systems and Mara is the mind. Remember that. So you have to, to do the work in that way. But who is, according to this book, the Bible, it says that the father of, uh, of uh, Canaan was Ham, the mind, of course. Because to the mind is how you start having this trade, this relationship with the physical world, and you forget about your being because you become identified with the physical world. And when you become identified with the physical world, you develop desire. How do you call this desire within you? When that desire is built, because the impressions of the physical world enter into your senses and create sensations. Those sensations are related with that that we call desire. When you like one sensation, you said, I want to repeat that sensation. I like this cake. I want to eat that cake again. That sensation creates desire. 
how the Bible called desire, or how it's written according to this story, this myth. It's called Kush. And Kush in Hebrew means black. Of course, black is the color for desire. That means that desire captures the light as the charcoal captures the fire. You see? You want fire. You want light. You light the charcoal and it's black and you release the energy. Desire is like that. Desire is something black in an ass that captures the light because you become identified with the exterior world creating desire. You don't transform that. So kush is precisely desire. So there are many kush in the, in the world as people that have desire. Lust is kush. Anger is kush. Hatred is kush. Pride is kush. Envy is kush. Laziness is kush. Gluttony is kush. And we can be named here all day about all the defects that we have. And that is kush. Black desire. The trap, the light of the being. And that's why you follow the sequence of this. It is stated in the Bible that Cush was the father of Nimrod. And we talk about Nimrod in the past lecture. We stated that Nimrod is the personality that we have. You have a personality that you created from childhood and that you strengthen it or educate it until this moment. Personality is borrowed knowledge from the exterior world. Your name is from the exterior world. Your father named you, put you a name, and you have a last name related with your family of the physical world, the exterior world. You learn your habits, your customs, you learn your education in the school, high school, universities, and you continue educating your personality. But the father of that personality is your own desires. Because people have this society, which is the outcome of desire. Kush. So Nimrod is precisely the builder of the Tower of Babel. Do you follow now that, how it is in relation with each one of us? Nimrod is our personality. Father of Kush, I mean the son of Kush, desire. And Kush is the outcome of Canaan, the census, the traitor. And Canaan, of course, is the son of the mind that identifies with the exterior world. That's why now, in order to go out of this confusion of tongues, we got to go and to teach the mind to follow the being, to follow the mona, to follow the spirit. But the mind is a donkey. The mind is a mule. It's a stubborn. And you know that because you have one. To educate that donkey and to transform that donkey into a human being is a great task. A human being to the image of God that obeys only God. So the whole work of the self-realization is that. But we call how this society is precisely following Nimrod and following Cush and following Canaan and following Ham, which discover the neckness of Noah, their inner being. That they need more knowledge. And they think that the knowledge that they want will find it outside. The knowledge that we need is inside. The only two Children that understood that were the other children of Noah, Shem and Japheth. And they walked backwards and covered Noah with a blanket, cover his neckness with a blanket. There's a meaning there. Walking backwards in order not to see means not to identify with the physical senses. And that was Noah comes out in his senses and says, Canaan will be the servant of of Shem, Canaan will be the servant of Yafet. 
what is saying there? That the senses, the traitors that we have, which are the senses, will be the servants of willpower and the servants of emotion. That will, you, will acquire that knowledge in you. But don't trust in your mind because that's Ham. He's the one that betrayed Noah and that betray in different ways, in different uh, parts of the Bible. This is precisely the, the point here. Now, as you know, we have three brains. The intellectual brain, the emotional brain, and the sexual motor instinctual brain. We always mention that. Because these two brains are the three vehicles of the three primary forces that we started talking in the beginning. But people don't care about these three primary forces. They squander the energy through the three brains. And you find intellectuals. Intellectual people, they utilize their brain. And Nimrod control these people in order to hunt for knowledge. So we have, of course, that they are... Uh, intellectual people in this physical world that are, I mean, the center of gravity is in the intellect. But there are many types of intellectual people that they don't control the three brains. They don't control the emotional brain. They don't control their, their motor brain. And the intellectual people below them, we have the emotional people that are related with the emotional center, like actors and actresses. These people are people that are centered. The center of gravity is in the emotional center. And they follow uh, the impulses of their emotion, the sentiments. And they do not comprehend the intellectuals. And it's precisely because each one of these people have an idol. Let us talk about the intellectuals that only believe in what the five senses tell them. He says, I don't believe in anything, but only what my five senses tell me. Usually they become atheists. If I cannot see God with the five senses, I don't believe in God. I am atheist, they say. What is the main doctrine of these atheists in this day and age? It's called evolution. We do, not, we do not deny the law of evolution. But when we talk about evolution, we are talking about we are talking about the dogma of evolution. Which is that uh, dogma created by Darwin. And I don't need to talk about that because there's a lot of people that know about that, etc., but in which uh, the law of evolution is mixed with beliefs. Believe this, believe that. There are no proof of what they say or what they state. So therefore, uh, uh, in the intellectual level, in the intellectual brain, you have people that study evolution also, but also they believe in God. Also, that study evolution, they don't believe in God. So there is confusion there. Many times you see them in, the, in forums, in the TV, arguing. The ones that uh, believe in evolution but believe in God, they call it creationism. The ones that don't believe in creationism but believe uh, in evolution, they're evolutionists. None of them have proof of anything. Because everything is in relation with, with certain theories. In the intellectual level, the theory is called, or the dogma is called theory. They say, no, I don't, I don't believe in beliefs, I, only in theories. I study theories. But theory is something that is not proved yet. So, so they are really also believers. It's just changing from one point to the other. Some Christians or some uh, religious people from any other religion, not only Christians, but we say Christians now here because we're talking about the book of Genesis, which is symbol. When they do not understand that and they study, uh, st start studying evolution or the dogma of Darwin, 
they turn into, into that. This is the mind, because the mind is always the streams, you know? Like the, like the, the pendulum. Go to the left, go to the right. Go to the left, go to the right. Believe, don't believe. So they are in confusion. And they are always in great uh, arguments. And of course, in the heart also. In the heart you have the people that really put their heart in a very negative way. and call the blind faith. That they believe in something, but they have proof of it. They don't awake in their senses. And in that, you, call, you find a mysticism. The different religions. You find Christianity. People that are devoted to Christianity. People that are devoted to Judaism. People that are devoted to Hinduism. People that are devoted to Buddhism. Taoism. And you name it. Many scriptures, many religions that teach. But they only believe in it. And they make war against each other. And right now you know the war that are against Muslims, against Jews, Jews against Christians. And in many other parts of the world, there are Muslims against Hindus, like in India. And it's because they are confused. And why they are confused? Because they are putting all that knowledge in Nimrod, the personality. Yeah. But the, there is no wars in, in, in religion, only in religious people that do not understand. Because when you understand and comprehend the, the basis of religion, you understand that those principles that we are talking here are also in Hinduism and also in Buddhism. It's also in Judaism. It's everywhere. We are not because they say, oh, the Bible says that, that we are the only ones that know it. No. If you read all the, like the Popol Vuh, the Bible of the Mayans, the three principles are written there. But in other names, of course. So those three principles are found everywhere in different religions. But people that do not know that, that don't study that, they make wars. They are confused. Because they are worshipping idols. To worship an idol doesn't mean that you have to have a statue. Because this is what people think. To worship an idol is to have a statue there with a symbol of something and, and kneel and said, uh, you are my God. No. An idol means to make in your mind a concept, a theory that you cannot prove. That is from the exterior world. That's why we stated in the last lecture that Nimrod is a hunter. Means that hunts from the outside world, and based on that, he makes an idol. And people worship that idol. But many idols are people in the world. If you don't know the meaning of Christianity, you make an idol of Christianity. If you don't know the meaning of Judaism, you make an idol of Judaism. If you don't know the meaning of evolution, you make an idol of Darwin. Hmm? If you don't understand the last of the universe and you start reading about the theory of the Big Bang that started with explosion. Explosion of what? Well, something that there was in the beginning like was concentrated, an atom of an egg, who knows, that exploded. Okay, let us say that that's true. Who put that egg or that atom there in the space with nothing? Who put it there? Oh, from where it comes. They don't answer it. They don't know that. So they have, they're making an idol of that theory. There are many theories in the intellectual brain created by many individuals. And many people follow that and make an idol of it. And what about in this center? The motor instinct, instinctual sexual brain. Oof, that's full of idols. Here, in this motor center, the lower part of the body, we have everything that is in relation with dance. People that uh, express their, their psychology through that center. Football players. 
boxers, martial, uh, martial arts, uh, yeah, all of those, all of those related with the motor center. For instance, an abuse of the sexual center, which in this case we will say it, prostitution, homosexuality, lesbianism, all type of degeneration of the sexual organ. People worship that. People worship in this day and age the idol of homosexuality, the idol of lesbianism, of prostitution, of adultery, fornication, you name it. All the deeds or relations, actions related with the motor center. There's confusion. There are people that says, no, in order to be holy, you don't have to have sexual act. So there, so they become celibate. Hmm? Celibacy is another idol. And there are many monks, many nuns that follow that. The sexual act is something necessary, but with wisdom. You have to know how. Tantra. You have to learn to study that. But if you abstain of sex, that's violence. So there's a lot of confusion, you see, because their personality has some information about certain things that they do not understand. So they make of that information an idol. That's why it is written in the book of Genesis that Nimrod was the builder of the Tower of Babel. But now you understand that that Tower of Babel is in relation with Nimrod, with Cush, with Canaan and with Ham, the mind. No matter in which brain you are situated, you are following an idol within. So therefore, the whole society is a confusion of tongues. Because everybody express through their mouth what they know, what they think it is. And behold, this society now is a chaos. It's a havoc. What do we, ne we need to do is to form an equilibrium. We have to understand that we have three brains. The intellectual brain, the emotional brain, and the motor sexual instinctual brain. We have to equilibrate these three brains in order not to become confused to come out of the Tower of Babel. And that's why it is written there that when God descends and enters and see what are the children of God, the children of men doing in this day and age, in this society, in this civilization, he discovered that they are building towers. He discovered that we have a tower you have a tower, and all of them are talking about certain things, and so there are many towers. Hmm? And you know, as I said, he descends through you. And then you find that, you are, uh, uh, that there is confusion of tongues. So then you need, of course, to organize your psyche. It's not that you have to believe in this. You have to be serious, okay, I am in this confusion of tongues and I am in this Tower of Babel. Which idol I am following? You discover that you are not following one idol but many. And there are people that even exteriorate that, uh, uh, that uh, idol stuff in the physical world. They said, oh, this is my idol. They said, verbally. Right? Utterly they said, this is my idol and I follow him. And people say, for instance, oh, what is the, the, the new, uh, how do you call the fashion now? It's according to what this person dress and the way that they dress, I want to dress as well. You see those people, for instance, that follow the idol that is called rap? You see them in the, in, in the street. They shower before living very well, very clean. And they, they fix themselves as they are dirty, that they are not, that they didn't shower. 
I don't know. This is a friend of mine said, I don't understand that. Me either. They clean first, they better perfume, and then they mess a mess of their hair. And they put pants which have holes in it. Because according to certain idols that I follow, they are doing the same thing. They are following an idol. And they go in the streets and they look like beggars. But they are clean. And you said, what is going on with this humanity? You need to clean yourself in order, in order to look like a beggar? Well, this is an idol, you see? And there are many idols like that in different places. And the people behave in different ways. And that is in relation with the motor sexual instinctual center. So, of course, we had to control our own particular Nimrod, which is our personality, in order not to follow the idol worshipped, which is in you, and to start following the, the, the forces, or the three primary forces, which is precisely a very a great task, great effort that we have to perform. And of course, uh, I can continue talking about this, but I think it is enough in order for you to understand the confusion of tongues in the Tower of Babel. Because when God descended, he said, Ekas, Ekas, Este, Bebeloi. And that's precisely a great phrase written among the great initials, which is this. Ekas, Ekas, este Bebeloi related to the Tower of Babel. Ekas, Ekas, Este, Bebeloi. What is that? Let me tell you a legend. Um, what you said... Uh, Bebeloi, with B. Be gone. Be gone, you profaners. You uh, unworthy ones. That's the meaning of that. So in every school of mysteries, when somebody was entering and receiving that, before realizing, before teaching, they were saying, Ekas, Ekas, Este, Bebeloi. Be gone, be gone, you impure, you profane. But it's not related with somebody that is outside. No, it's in you. Because the profaners, the unworthy ones, are within us. In our mind. Defects and vices that we have. So when we have that, or when, when you start any work, psychological work in you, or any esoteric work, you can pronounce that to, to, to you, to your, your, to your mind, and say, Ekas, Ekas, Este, Bebeloi. You can be gone, be gone, you unworthy. This is your mind. And Bebeloi is the Babel, the Tower of Babel, which is a confusion, worship of idols within you. B E B E L O I, Bebeloi. <coughs> the Babel, the confusion of tongues. Those Bebeloi, those profaners, are within your intellectual center, your emotional center, and your motor, instinctual, sexual center. And in mind too. So you have questions? Lucifer is a mediator, of course. But when the mind interferes and becomes identified with the exterior world, makes of Lucifer Satan. So who made Lucifer Satan? Was the mind, your mind. So now you have to make that Satan and to turn it into convert it into Lucifer again, a giver of light. But that's a great work. 
because uh, Satan is very strong and he's one of us. Yeah, the being utilizes the mind in order to test you. Because remember that I said, ham is the mind. And through the senses is how the mind finds the exterior world. So, of course, Satan tempts you to the senses. Right? For instance, they said, in your heart, you follow your heart, it says, My father, I want to become chaste. Meaning, I want to transmute my sexual force and give it to you. That's Tantra. You know? And then your God will tell you that. You are put, you're giving me your heart. You want to be chased. You want to create your inner solar bodies. Good. But then the mind says, okay, let's see if you really are worthy. And then the mind tests you to the senses. And as a man, you are walking in the streets and you see a beautiful woman in front of you. That Impression entered to the senses, and your mind tells you, look at her. In the mind, of course, is kush, the lust. And, and you are trying to control it, and say, no mind, I don't follow you, I follow my inner being, and you continue there. But for that, you have to be here now, all the time. But there are many people that start in the path, and they want to be chased. Immediately, they do their pranayama, exercises, etc., and they go outside of the world, they are falling into the temptation of their mind every second, every minute. So when they return to their home, they are failures. So of course, this is a, a, a path that is very patient. You have to work very hard against your mind to control it, to teach her. I said her because the mind is passive, takes from the exterior world. You have to educate it. That's why it says that the land of Cush. What do you think is the land of Cush that the Genesis talk about? It's the physical body. Right? So the monad works through the land of Cush. The physical body should be the temple of God. But you had to transform that blackness into light. And remember, that blackness is in relation with your own psyche. It's not what other people think. That uh, because Kush is black, they were condemning or damning the, the black people. It has nothing to do with the color of the skin, but the color of your psyche. Yeah? Yeah, of course. This is a mantra in order to reject the forces. Your own egos. Is it a mantra or is it a pronounced like as a prayer? Well, a mantra means a, 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 it means a powerful word. But I know, but to mentalize it? Like, do it as a mantra or just to do it? Like just to do it that way. But uh, le let me tell you, uh, uh, if you have 10,000 egos, you have to pronounce it 10,000 times. So that's, you know. But that's the meaning of that. But that but in, in the higher chambers of any white lodge, before starting any work, they always said, Ekas, Ekas, Este Bebeloi. Because they don't want the outside egos of any person to interfere in that holy ritual. Neither the ego that they have within. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, in essence, when they said old Canaanite temple, it means old traders, God's old temple, uh, excuse me. Um, the traders, of course, are those that follow the mind. There are people that think, uh, they said, oh, we don't follow Canaan because it's damned, right? But everybody follows Canaan because the mind, especially those that make of their life a trader, a merchant, you know, what is what Jesus of Nazareth did when he came 
into the temple of Jerusalem. He took the wheel, the whip, which symbols willpower, and took the traders, the merchants, out of the temple. This is Canaan, you know, because all of us are making of the temple of God, which is a physical body, a house of trading, right? This is what we do, it's a business, you know what I mean? And obviously we, for that, because of that trading uh, ab- uh, habit that we have, we create a lot of kush, a lot of egos within. One more, uh, one more question. Um, you said that the heart is the only true follower uh, of the Father, or of, of heaven, rather, of the law. Uh, there's, a, there, there's a person that I know, and he said that every time he follows his heart, he gets into trouble, but now he follows his mind. So... <laughs> Well, the heart is in relation with the voluntary and involuntary movements of the other centers. You see? So the heart deals with the involuntary and with the voluntary. When the hearts follow the voluntary commandments of God, it's good. But in the heart also, it's written in the Bible, we have the evil thoughts. Meaning, when you allowed your evil thoughts to enter into your heart and come out from you. Right? But the only element, that's why, uh, in order to enter into the initiation, you have to follow your heart. Because the heart deals with the commandments of God and also knows what you have within. Through the heart is how you start. This is what Noah made. Noah, which is the atom nous or the ventricle of the heart, enters into the ark by commandments of God. But he enters with all the animals. Because he has to control the animals. Or in other words, the animal elements that we have within. We have to control that. That we explained that in the other lectures. I'm not going to go deep and down because if you want to know about that, there's two lectures about the Ark of Noah. And of course, if you study those lectures, you will know how to control your elements, your animal elements. And that's why uh, you have to strengthen your heart, in other words. Your friend that says that uh, when he follows his heart, he gets in trouble, is because he is following the involuntary movements connected to their heart in relation with uh, the three brains. It doesn't mean that because you start now following your heart, oh, your life will be peachy. No. You have to work a lot. Because remember that even Noah was drunk and Ham betrayed him. His own mind. Right? So, the mind, as the Master Samael says, is always the cause of the falling of any initiate. Any. That's the mind. That's why the mind, in this case, is the tempting serpent of Eden. That invites you to eat what you shouldn't eat. Do you have another question? If you have it, then you can uh, write it in the forum. And uh, But remember, I advise you to study the tree of life and to meditate. It's not just to read the Bible, like literally, because that's a waste of time. You have to read one paragraph, meditate in it. This lecture that I'm giving to you is an outcome of meditation, of comprehension on my own path. And it's because I learn how to read you don't have to read the Bible as when you read the newspaper. People are that. Even the Gnostic books. Matthew Samael said that he took one year in order to write one book. And one of his students arrived at his home and says, study this. And then he asked the next day, so how is the study of my book that I gave you? Oh, good, Master. I read it in three hours. What? You read it in three hours what I wrote in one year? What do you get from it? I didn't say read it like a newspaper. Study it. Meditate in it. Because every single thing has its meaning. The same for